It's my pleasure to welcome our next speaker, the Honourable Claire O'Neill, Australia's Minister for Home Affairs and Minister for Cyber Security, who's joining us live from Canberra to provide a keynote address. Well, good afternoon, everyone, and I'm so pleased to be addressing the Sydney Dialogue this year, and I'm just really sorry that I couldn't be with you all in person, but I know there's lots of colleagues and friends in the room, so good afternoon to you all. Could I acknowledge um, the, today that I'm on um, the traditional lands of the Nullarbor and Nambri people in Canberra, and I acknowledge their elders past and present. Um, I really couldn't pass up the chance to speak with you about what's going on in cybersecurity since our government was elected in May 2023 and share a picture of where we're taking this incredibly important part of protecting Australia's national security. This has been an absolutely tremendous year in cybersecurity. As you all know, last year, Australia experienced the Optus and Medibank attack, the two biggest cyber attacks in Australian history, that occurred within three weeks of each other. For a lot of you in this room, the big challenge of um, cybersecurity before these incidents was how to get this taken seriously within the community and within your organisations. But now it's at the top of the agenda, at the boardroom table and at the kitchen table. One of the first decisions that Prime Minister Albanese made was to appoint a cabinet minister with responsibility for cybersecurity. And that's the first time that that's been done in Australia. And I just can't emphasise how important having a standalone cabinet minister with that responsibility is. You would see a lot of this in your own organisations. When cyber is competing with other risks and priorities, it can be the ninth or tenth thing on the to-do list of leadership when it's distributed around an organisation. For me, this is the top issue on my mind every single day, and that has allowed us to move really quickly. A big part of the Australian government's approach is punching back at cyber attackers for the first time. So we're doing that through our Hack the Hackers task force. This is a 100 strong force of Australian Signals Directorate and AFP officers who are hacking back at the criminals who would seek to do Australia harm. Australia is working really closely with international partners, obviously essential to this problem. And we're doing that mainly under the counter ransomware initiative. So Australia is leading this initiative across uh, an, a, dozens of countries around the world, which is trying to get global cooperation on how we tackle ransomware. In February this year, you hopefully noticed that the Prime Minister announced the establishment of a national cybersecurity coordinator role within the Home Affairs Department. And this is um, targeted at getting renewed focus on strategically managing all of the dispersed cybersecurity operations that occur across the Australian government. In August last year, I announced that Australia would develop a new cybersecurity strategy. So my aspiration for the country is that I want us to be the most cybersecure nation in the world by 2030. We want to ensure that we're working to protect our people and our economy. We want government to be leading on cybersecurity. And of course, we want to support our friends and partners around the region. We cannot do this without the input of the people who are in the room right now. So we've released a discussion paper to support the strategy. If you haven't read it, please go ahead and do. Find it online and please come back to us with your comments and um, any feedback that you have to us. So. As I said, the government's got huge commitment to that, and that commitment was recognised last month when the Massachusetts Institute of Technology ranked Australia number one in the world amongst countries showing the greatest progress and commitment to enhancing cybersecurity. To get that endorsement from MIT after only what was at the time sort of eight or nine months of hard work, it shows us that we're going in the right direction, and that's really good news, but the reality is we are only just getting started. So today I wanted to talk a little bit about the threat landscape, the actors and the technology, and speak a little bit about what the future of this problem looks like. And let me say at the outset that despite the threats we face, I am absolutely convinced that as a nation, we are up to the challenge here. We've got amazing cyber experts in the room right now. I spend a lot of time with the brilliant, passionate Australians who work at the Australian Signals Directorate, or in the security operations centres of corporate Australia. And I feel really confident that we can meet this task because of the commitment and dedication of those people. The apex predators in this space are the advanced persistent threats or APTs, traditionally directed to use cyber means to fulfil the strategic intent of state-based actors. 
the technical capability and the targeting intent are in varying forms directed, enabled and supported by state sponsors. We've seen examples where APTs infiltrate and infest critical infrastructure systems or attempt to take them over in order to exert leverage. APTs can be the hardest threat to tackle. They demand the full spectrum of the brightest minds and the deepest technical knowledge across the Australian government and all of our friends and partners in industry. And that's because of the deep sophistication of the tools, techniques and procedures. So we're trying to hack back at these partners, but the scale of deployment um, can only usually be generated by these adversaries when there's the resources of a nation state behind them. Australia and other like-minded nations will obviously call out and attribute these threats where it's in our national interest to do so. But today I wanna to make the case that the global gang of bad cyber actors and those operating in the gray zone between nation state intent and financially motivated criminal conduct are also just as important when we think about cybersecurity as national security. Part of waking up from the cyber slumber is acknowledging this reality. The harm and the inconvenience that is wrought by the huge data leaks through the exploitation of basic vulnerabilities from actors ranging from your proverbial teenager in a faded black hoodie in mum and dad's basement to high end threats is a very big national problem. But the truth is we face a scale and intensity in our threat landscape that far outstrips the recent cases that we have seen. Optus and Medibank are the tip of the iceberg. Financially motivated cyber actors and extortionists are public enemy number one. These groups subvert legitimate business models for financial gain. They create online portals for hacking as a service where anyone can purchase the tools and support necessary to conduct a cyber incident or data breach, especially in the form of a ransomware attack. In Australia, the, the Australian Cybersecurity Centre has seen ransomware as a service products, and most recently you would have seen this with Lockbit 3.0, deployed at wide scale and opportunistically against businesses. So that's included a logistics firm and a charity that delivers vital services in the remote outback. The group behind the attacks then offer this stolen data in the darkest corners of the internet. Some of the groups posing the greatest threat operate with the sanction and willful blindness of nation states in which they physically work and operate. And in, that, in this way, they can be thought of as a kind of adjunct or overlapped with the APTs as they contribute to this wider interests of the state sponsor. These criminal groups are fully vertically integrated throughout their business model with parts of their business ranging from cyber arms to illicit financial services, partner relationships and customer facing systems, read extortion and research and development. So this drives a very aggressive product strategy from these actors, both competing and collaborating in their product offerings on access and exploitation tools, lease agreements for their use and numerous means to on-sell and exploit compromised data. These organisations are fueled by the dark web, web and crypto and their business models scale because of the digitisation of our economic life. So as we introduce more tech into our systems, these actors will see new markets to enter and all aspects of their business will be given the opportunity to proliferate. While APTs might be deep and narrow, this global ransomware environment that I've described is prolific and it's increasingly capable because of the networks and relationships between the people who operate them. So in terms of intent, while the motivation here is profit, the target set is where they confuse vulnerability with extortion. While an APT might spend months or years working on a critical target, these groups represent a threat to our national economic life because every sector, every business that can pay is a target. Just like how critical infrastructure is so critical because of it, how it interacts with the wider economy, these attacks are rarely isolated. Given what we've seen with the combined breaches of Optus and Medibank and now Latitude, there probably is not an Australian who either has not been impacted personally by these data breaches or does not have a close family member that has. Last week, you would have seen that Latitude advised that a forensic review of their cyber incident has uncovered the fact 
that 14 million records, so somewhere around 7.9 million Australian and New Zealand licence numbers, 53,000 passport numbers and 100 monthly financial statement records has been exposed. The personal information impacted here includes names, addresses, telephone numbers and dates of birth. So when you add these three incidents together, we've got in vast majority the Australian population, probably every Australian family who's had their privacy breached in some way. So um, we have a community of people who are really angry about what's happened here. And recall how these breaches occupied national news for weeks on end. They consumed enormous resources of the Commonwealth, the Australian Signals Directorate, the Australian Federal Police, and numerous other federal and state agencies. So if every business is a target, every Australian is a risk, our government response has to be significant. And that means our national choices, our economic prosperity, our peace of mind as citizens and a nation are directly threatened by these groups. The impact on our sovereignty and our way of life is why ransomware threat actors are a core national security challenge for Australia. So one of the reasons that I am pushing government so hard on the creation of a 2030 cyber strategy is because that conversation that we're having about cyber threats is too much in the here and now. And those of you here who know what we are facing understand that this cyber threat is changing and growing by the day. So why do I say this? One reason is how technology is reshaping cyber crime. There is a major paradigm shift occurring in the intersection of humans and technology and cybersecurity. Today's cyber challenge has at its heart a very simple fact. At present, a clear majority of data breaches can be traced to human error. So it's the theft of credentials. It's the accidental clicking of a staff member on a viral link in an email, which effectively lets an attacker in the front door. And from there, the attacker can wreak havoc. Also on the defence side, ultimately a failure to patch is not usually an IT failure. It's a failure of system design, of organisation culture, of straight up just information and education of consumers, or perhaps an unwillingness of, in companies to invest in what's needed. So as the technology becomes more advanced, as we progress towards 2030, this ratio is gonna change. There will be more attacks that are purely technological, less human, and that makes them harder to defend against. A second major change is that we are all seeing more and more aspects of our life move online. So the internet of things is of course going to see billions more devices connected to the internet from our baby monitors to our toasters. We'll have digitized, more digitized cities. And so what we are seeing is the internet of things combining with these technological trends that will produce a new kind of cyber threat by 2030. And that is where we need to take this national conversation. Now, of course, technological advantage flows in both directions. Technology is enhancing and will enhance further the opportunities for cyber crime. It also enhances the opportunities that we have for cyber defence. And in fact, today, I would say, if anywhere, the initiative is with cyber defence because automation is favouring detection and blocking rather than penetration and movement. What I'm concerned about as we lead into 2030 is keeping governments and police and the good guys in this race ahead of the game. That's where we all need to be focused. So let me be clear, I'm not saying that the following dystopian futures will actually happen, um, but there is one thing that I've learned about this cyber portfolio, and that is that we need to um, determine what the consequential scenarios look like and work to consider how to stop them. So let's consider a world where we have AI-driven lateral movement, which outpaces internal cyber defences, where we have quantum decrypts, which allow for previously encrypted and secure, highly sensitive data sets that can suddenly be compromised. Instead of data breaches, where we have data integrity attacks, so where attackers enter a system and introduce errors into that system, which are designed to produce outsized implications. Think of the impacts on a bank or other types of financial institutions. Um, think about our interconnected cities and how these could be held hostage through interference in everything from traffic lights to surgery schedules. It's very important to remember that all of those technologies present new, um, new opportunities for collaboration. So our government is working really hard in all of our thinking about this space 
to balance the risks against the big opportunities that are presented in an online world. So I raise these issues not to scare people, but just to try to help people understand why it's so important that we go through that task in the cyber strategy, strategy, not just of catching up on some of the areas where we've fallen pretty badly behind, but really thinking about the 2030 environment that we are designing this strategy for, how we can anticipate problems in it and prepare the country for it. So as I said, this is about how we make Australia the most cyber secure country in the world by 2030. To do that, we have to understand the context. So to, the, to this end, the, there are four big th themes that are, um, that are sort of coming up as this, in the cyber strategy to shape up the initiatives and how our country will mobilise behind the task I've described here. The first is we've got to be a hard target. The second is we've got to fight back against the threat. Third, we've got to bounce back quickly when we get hit because no matter what we do, we are not going to reduce cyber risk to zero. And to do all of those three things, we need a really strong, powerful cybersecurity ecosystem for Australia. So let me say a few words about fighting back. Last year, Australia put hackers on notice. We're going to hack back. Our objective is to put the same type of fear into hackers and ransomware groups as they try to exert on their victims onto ordinary Australians. We want hackers to think twice about targeting Australia's interests uh, and we are working on that with some of our closest allies and partners to impose real debilitating costs to shatter the technological capabilities of those groups and to undermine the cohesion of those threats by targeting all aspects of their business model, such as this, the ransomware as a service that I referred to earlier. The Australian Signals Directorate's ACSC has also seen non-state actors such as cyber gangs working alongside states and that is amplifying the potential for damaging cyber attacks. So our concern here is that these non-state actors are ungoverned, their impacts are unpredictable and this may have flow-on effects for Australia and the supply chains that we rely on. Until now, there have been few cases where these actors have injected their influence into international affairs in such a prominent and direct way. But the non-state actors' intervention in the Russia-Ukraine conflict is a harbinger of things to come. It has significantly expanded how we can think about these groups' engagement in the digital space. Hacking back can also play a role in mitigating the consequences of an attack. So we've seen that in some cases by taking down stolen data from the dark web so it can't be weaponised against citizens, businesses or our country. Hacking back provides confidence and assurance that Australia is not going to be a soft touch when it comes to cyber threats and it's a really important demonstration of our national resolve. How Australia, our government, our businesses, our citizens make themselves secure from cyber attacks is of course the central challenge of the cybersecurity strategy. And today I wanted to just give a brief insight into some of the questions we're exploring through the discussion paper and encourage you to make a submission to contribute to the development of that strategy. So one of the first things that we've heard really loud and clear is the need for government to lead by example on the cybersecurity of our own systems and services. And this is something that if there is a failure in cybersecurity of the former government, this is it. There were multiple ANAO reports on the cybersecurity un underperformance. Um, we saw the former government rely on voluntary measures and fail to make the sort of meaningful progress that would set us up to keep pace with the evolving threat landscape that I've described. If I can just give an example, in 2022, the Commonwealth Cyber Posture Report found that most government entities did not meet the minimum requirements for cybersecurity. There was incredibly low uptake of the cyber defence services that the Australian Signals Directorate offers to other parts of government and less than a half of the entities um, that were looked at were regularly exercising their incident response plans. I also want to explore how government can be the purchaser of our own innovation to create that cyber sovereign cyber security ecosystem that will be so fundamental to our national security in 2030. We know that this has got to be a mix of incentives and regulation, and especially ensuring that where there's a case for regulation, it's sensible, it's streamlined, and it can be complied with in the midst of a cyber attack on a business. 
Given the type of threats I've identified above are proliferating, fueled by technological advancement and impacting the nation as a whole, what does threat sharing and threat blocking look like in 2030? So it's a really key question for the strategy and something that the, um, the leader of the expert advisory board, Andy Penn, and I are spending a lot of time thinking and talking about at the moment. What success might look like is where even though every one of us can and should be part of the solution to harden our digital lives to cyber threats, the core responsibility for managing cyber risks rests with those who have the scale and reach to achieve it. So this is especially true when we're thinking about corporate and big tech sectors who know their network, their data and criticality, their vulnerabilities, we want these guys to take responsibility for securing that data and in fact doing what they can do to protect the rest of our population. So for corporates and especially technology and service providers, this might look like um, the right investment to uplift and build in security to their systems and services. It might be thinking about the relationships that they have with regulators, including rigorous application of the risk management programs that sit underneath the Security of Critical Infrastructure Act. Um, it might look like machine-to-machine -machine threat sharing and blocking in partnership with the Australian Cyber Security Centre and the Australian Signals Directorate. Now, because you can't surge trust in a crisis, today I'm announcing the rollout of a national cyber exercise series where we will systematically and frequently exercise with entities covered under the Security of Critical Infrastructure Act in a sectoral and cross-sectoral basis supported by the Cyber and Infrastructure Security Group in my department and led by the National Cyber Coordinator and in partnership with Critical Infrastructure. I've said Australia is waking up from the cyber slumber, now we've got to hit the gym. This exercise series will build muscle memory in how we deal with a cyber attack and really importantly, it will cover the type of incidents that we haven't yet experienced on a national scale. We're thinking here about the lockup of critical infrastructure and integrity attacks on critical data. We are going to look at how we work with governments, including dealing with the consequences of a crisis that will inevitably not impact just one company, but as we've seen with these data breach style attacks, potentially millions of Australians. And I have no doubt we will discover some areas where we need to train harder on incident response ensuring that these incident response plans don't just sit on the, felt, on, on the shelf. Being forewarned is forearmed. This initiative is something that has been raised with me in a number of cybersecurity consultations. In fact, I would say it's probably come up in just about every round table that we've hosted. And while there have been some great examples of targeted exercising, we've got to move faster and in a more integrated way. This is not something we should be thinking about in 2025, 25, 6. We need to start this today. And this is something that we can't wait for the strategy even to get completed before we get started. So let me just finish with a few words about bouncing back. When it comes to resilience from cyber attacks, there are two things that we need to do. First class consequence management, and we've got to build agility into the system so that shocks can be absorbed. The first thing I'd say is how steadfast Australians have been in um, how they, as individuals, as citizens, as families, have managed these cyber attacks, in some cases where their most sensitive information has been needlessly compromised. One of the things that's made me um, just incredibly proud as I've played my part in managing the cyber attacks that we've experienced as a country is that ordinary Australians and the media didn't even think of playing the voyeur in seeing what data they could access on the dark web. They respected that a crime was in train and that they would be supporting criminals if they went looking for what data was available. In the national mind, diving into stolen data, people's personal data in particular, was a red line that very few people in our country crossed and I'm really proud about that. Second, business footed the bill in offering identity theft protection and covering the cost of issuing new credentials. And I think that's really important that we do push responsibility where it lies appropriately in these situations and in these contexts it was business. The government rallied through um, the national coordination mechanism, which was the way which we have um, used to ensure that different agencies in the government and each cyber attack has its own sort of unique features and brings in different parts of government, were brought together to try to mitigate and assist Australians who were uh, the subject of breaches. Now, I want to emphasise that data breaches are only one type of cyber incident. They are one we've unfortunately become very familiar with. 
But only this morning I was talking with my colleagues um, in Cabinet about the urgent need to refresh the way we are thinking about identity resilience together with our state and territory counterparts. So the Minister for Finance, Katie Gallagher, is showing huge leadership on this particular issue and trying to assist and support the government to do the complex work that's behind moving forward on a new national digital ID system. So this will streamline transactions, it will reduce the need for companies to hold unnecessary data. And when they do hold personal data, it will make sure that that data has the highest level of protection. So ultimately, this is all about reducing the benefits of cybercrime by making Australian identities hard to steal. And for citizens, when those identities and if those identities are compromised, making them easier to restore. We're also looking very closely at the Australian government's cyber coordination arrangements, and we're doing that through the National Office of Cybersecurity within the Department of Home Affairs. The appointment of the coordinator that I talked about demonstrates our commitment to responding properly to cyber incidents. I absolutely can see and accept that there's ways that the Australian government can work more seamlessly with companies that are under cyber attack. We're here to support the community in managing this problem and I want to see us do that better. It kind of comes with the territory in um, my role, Minister for Home Affairs and Minister for Cyber Security, that some of the issues we deal with can be perceived as quite dark. And I have spoken a few about a few dark topics um, this afternoon. But what I actually really want to say is that when it comes to cyber security, there is a huge case here for optimism and opportunity. We have come such a long way as a country in less than a year. If we can do all this in a year, Think about where we could be in five years. There is a real chance here for Australia to be a leader when it comes to cybersecurity and the jobs and the industries and the growth that come from that. And we are building on an amazing national platform to do it. We've got a robust parliament and a tradition of world first, world class legislative responses. We've got nation building investments like the National Reconstruction Fund that I know you would have heard from Ed Husick about. We've got Brendan O'Connor doing this really important and valuable work with Jobs and Skills Australia under the um, amazing education system that he shares leadership of with Jason Clare. We've got Australia back in the global commons with credible foreign policy led by the amazing Penny Wong and Tim Watts. And we've got real commitment to the overall cybersecurity challenge being shown by the Prime Minister and the Deputy Prime Minister. So in conclusion, can I leave you all with a challenge? I've talked to you a little bit this afternoon about the cyber strategy. If you haven't read the discussion paper, please do so. And if you read the strategy and you've got ideas and you haven't made a submission yet, jump on your keyboard and share what you have with us. We're really, really keen to hear from you. And second, I just wanna leave you with some thanks. Um, the work that is done by the people who are in the room right now is the absolute foundation for everything we are trying to work on at the moment for cybersecurity in our country. The only reason that we are able to move pretty quickly with government commitment now is because all of you in this room have been working so hard on this subject over a really long period of time. And in that, I'd really like to thank in particular Aspie um, for the work that you've done, the leadership that you've shown. And I'm really grateful today for the opportunity to address this really important dialogue and very hopeful next year that I'll be there with you in person. Thanks so much, everyone. Mm -hmm.